great to see each and every one of you here this morning. Man, I tell you what, the last couple of weeks have been uh, eventful um, and, and tragic in many ways. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, obviously, the shooting down uh, in Florida um, that we, we need to just, man, pour our prayers out on the families and really the communities in the state of Florida because of that and, and really then our nation because it just the, uh, the impact of that spills over into fears and a lot of other things. Um, so be praying, obviously, in that way. But then on top of that, then the death of uh, Billy Graham this week was just a monumental time. He's been sick for a long time, 99 years old. But just the, the gravity of uh, just his impact on the culture in North America over the years, uh, been reminded of all of that. If you think through just the fact that he has preached in 185 countries um, by radio and television, the estimate is 2.2 billion people have heard the gospel through one man. That is shocking. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Praise God for his life, man. And, uh, and I know we're praying for their family and that kind of thing, but I would just say, let's add this to that. Pray for our country. This is a time, anytime something like that happens, obviously, if you get on the uh, internet and, and read comments. I mean, you can find even positive and negative things about anybody, but, but the truth of the matter is it, it opens up our eyes to our spiritual need. And so this could be a time. I'm praying for a revival across North America just as people's uh, awareness to their need for the gospel uh, of Jesus Christ is, uh, is kind of at high right now. And so uh, be praying for, for that to happen. Amy and I just drove back this morning from Charlotte where we had the getaway Man, just to kind of say, next uh, time we have the, the retreat, I just want to encourage you to go. We had uh, 40 couples that went up for the weekend. It was amazing. Wes and Janet came back as well, and uh, it was a great time. They're still finishing up. They were all worshiping up there uh, this morning uh, as we drove in. Just had a, a, a great uh, weekend. And so uh, reminding you to, to just prayerfully consider that next time. Another event's coming up real soon that was on the video talking about our, our ladies. They're relaunching the ladies' ministry. And even if you have been a part of it in the past, maybe you're new to the church and you just don't know anything about this, let me just encourage you, March 10th, go ahead and mark that down, ladies. And if your wife's not here, go ahead and men, mark it down to remind her because this is a, something they don't want to miss. It's a Saturday brunch uh, in the morning there, March 10th, and just an opportunity for you to connect with other ladies, but really just to hear the vision of the new ministry. Uh, this is, I say new, it's a renewed ministry where all the different areas of our ladies' ministry are coming together, and they're really just relaunching this thing as a unified front. It's going to be great. So but please go ahead and uh, make, make plans to attend that. Uh, you can actually sign up and register in the lobby today and go and save your spot. Uh, we're hoping and praying for just uh, hundreds of our ladies to be there from all campuses, all services. It's a multi-generational approach. Awesome. Struggles. We've, uh, this is the third week in struggles. We started a couple weeks back talking about uh, just the challenges that come because of the technological advancements and, and even the, the presence of social media in our day. Many in this room uh, can't even remember a time when social media didn't exist, where internet didn't exist. I mean, a lot of our younger adults uh, and below, you know, teenagers, I mean, they can't remember a time where there wasn't email and there wasn't, you know, uh, Instagram, there wasn't Snapchat, Facebook, whatever. And so some of us are kind of in that middle where we can remember before uh, all of the, the technology took over and all of that. But here's the deal, no matter who we are, we're all confronted by the benefit and the uh, burden that comes with all these advancements. Uh, and here's the deal, we talked about intimacy that first week and how intimacy has kind of been traded for interaction. And in the name of connection, we've become more disconnected in many ways by social media. We may have a, a ton of friends uh, or people we call friends or followers or whatever, but, uh, but really not connecting. You know, we're not really building relational intimacy. Not talking about relational intimacy in the sense of romanticism, but we're talking about deep relationships, meaningful relationships with friends. We've really pushed everyone that Sunday toward connect groups. If you're not part of a small group in our church, you need to do that today. Go back to guest services or go back to information services and, and find out. Hey, where's a list of connect groups? There are multitudes of options uh, to choose from in the way of connect groups. And we even have home groups. Uh, right now, I know, uh, we have some starting uh, uh, groups that are going to meet uh, for six to eight weeks. Uh, even we're meeting in, in uh, Bousquet's CrossFit place. That's going to be awesome. That's going to be a small group on uh, Sunday evening at four. And then we have Wednesday night uh, uh, connect groups and, and uh, Bible studies, all kind of options. So if you're not in one, 
go back and find out some information. So intimacy was the first struggle. The second one last week we talked about encouragement. You may say, well, I don't really struggle with encouragement, but I think if you think about it for just a moment, you will admit that we, had a, we have an issue because social media and, again, this Internet age where article after article comes up on your thread, if you click on the comments of all those articles and news stories, even if it's a positive story, there are people who are negative in the comments. In, encouragement, uh, in many ways, kind of become a thing of the past, man. People have replaced encouragement with criticism, and we usually posture ourselves in a position of uh, predetermined you know, position so that no matter what the question is, I've already got the answer. I don't even care what you think. I'm just going gonna, gonna to fight from my position instead of having dialogue. Man, the, the day of dialogue seems to be dead where people can come to a table, have a conversation about things, and even leave disagreeing but loving one another. See, that's, that's really the way we ought to be. So we talked about that struggle in our culture of how this, uh, in many ways, social media and, and, and the uh, Internet and technology has, has caused us that detachment, that disconnection has also led to an absence of encouragement, which is obviously part of what we're supposed to do as believers is to edify, to build up the body of Christ and encourage other people. But this third week, we're talking about worship and reclaiming worship. Now, you may say, well, what are we talking about reclaiming worship? We're, we're here, Wayne. We're in the worship center, man. I mean, so what are you talking about? We don't need to reclaim worship. And I think, again, this reveals a big problem we have in North America. I mean, we've named buildings worship centers. And, and I'm just going to clarify so nobody thinks this is where we're headed. We're not renaming the building, all right? We're not going to take that off the building. But here's what I want you to hear. That really leads to confusion many times because some people then elevate, elevate like the, the atmosphere or elevate the construction, the brick and the mortar of a building. And they think this is the only place worship takes place. And, and if that's our definition of worship, then we really haven't explored the Word of God to understand what worship is all about. Because this is corporate worship for sure. And we call this a praise band or a worship band, you know. Hey, by the way, Alex Kunar is amazing, man. He's kind of a new addition to the team. And isn't he awesome leading our worship today? Praise God for him. Man, but all, all of that team, that team of worship leaders... I mean, they're, they're fantastic, but here's the deal. They're not leading your worship on Monday, but you're still worshiping, right? Because it's a different kind of worship. It's not necessarily singing in worship. It's not necessarily, you know, hearing the word preached on Thursday afternoon, right? But here's the deal. Listen to this. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you are worshiping. Wait, wait a minute, preacher. You don't know me then because, honestly, I don't always live right. I mean, there's times I mess up. There's decisions I make that aren't good. And I'd say, exactly, you're worshiping even when you're making bad decisions. Because it's not a question of are you worshiping, it's a question of who or what are you worshiping, right? It's not a question of am I worshiping, it's a question of who or what am I worshiping? To what extent am I elevating Jesus in my life and what else is competing for his throne in my heart? And how much am I doing to allow him to sit there or am I moving him out of the way and putting something else into place? See, that's the question that's going to just rock us this morning as we look at this idea of reclaiming worship. And, and so here's what we're going to remember. That we worship every single day, every moment of every day, every hour we are worshiping. Um, so we're going to walk through four steps. You could call it four steps of reclaiming worship. And, and go and turn in, turn on your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4, we're going to read verses 16 through 19. kind of jumps right in the middle of a, of a paragraph, and so it's kind of an odd place to start. But the point of this passage is going to show us that idolatry, which is the, the enemy of worship, uh, of God, of the one true God, Id idolatry or idol worship, um, it ultimately comes in a lot of different forms, a lot of different shapes and sizes. Beginning there in verse 16, it says, "...so that you do not become corrupt." And make for yourselves an idol, an image of any shape, whether formed like a man or a woman, or like an animal on the earth, or like any bird that flies in the air, or hey, let me go and add this to, or moves on uh, along the ground, or a fish. Yeah, that's in the water below. I mean, that's an exhaustive list, right? So no matter what the shape is, um, verse 19, when you look up in the sky, even the sun and the moon, the stars, the heavenly array, do not be enticed 
into bowing down to them and worshiping things the Lord God has apportioned to all the nations under heaven. In other words, here's what the author of Deuteronomy is saying. He's saying, don't worship the provision over the provider. That makes no sense. Why would you worship things over the one who made the things, right? And so what it is, is that we understand that worship is happening all the time. We're constantly worshiping. The question is, who or what are we worshiping? First step of understanding or reclaiming worship is defining idolatry. We have to understand what idolatry is. In fact, if I were to ask you the question today, are you guilty of idol worship? Man, I guarantee you, Nobody would want to raise their hand. Nobody in here, even if you're an unbeliever, let's say if you don't follow Jesus, you still probably wouldn't want to consider yourself an idol worshiper. That's really not a very attractive characteristic or term to refer to yourself as. But here's the deal. Even followers of Jesus, I'm going to argue this morning, are and can be guilty of idol worship. You may say, well, wait a minute. A believer of Jesus can't worship idols, Wayne. Man, that's totally messed up. There's no way that's true. But you're going to see in Scripture that it's absolutely true. And the thing is, we we have a misunderstanding. We've redefined idolatry so that it kind of gives us a pass. It makes us feel better about ourselves. But we often are very guilty. See, idols come in all shapes and sizes. We all possess them at times. uh, and, And it's easy. It's so easy to be obsessed with technology, in particular this idea of technology, social media, and all that, man, it, it kind of eats our lunch when we think about it for a moment. I want to remind you of the book that I've encouraged you to go ahead and purchase. I'd go to Amazon, download it, or go to the bookstore and find it. You can go to Lifeway or any other Christian bookstore for sure. It's called Struggles. It has a hashtag in front of it. Hashtag Struggles. The author is Craig Groeschel. And man, I'm telling you, it will help you as a resource as we walk through this series to dive deeper into these ideas. Because what we're doing is really coming at Scripture, coming from Scripture with these ideas. But the book will give you a lot more of an individual, personal walk through this subject matter. But as we sit here, we understand that this is relevant. I want to show you some pictures that that are just everyday pictures of what we experience. The first one is uh, kind of younger adults, teenagers, maybe just hanging out, sitting around. And and I'm just going to tell you, this is not a rare picture, right? If you're walking around, if you're walking in a room or whatever at school, wherever you are, this is just normal now, right? If you walk into a group of people, generally speaking, even if it's a break or whatever, you're just kind of Everybody immediately kind of goes to their go-to, and they, they just kind of check it out and see what's going on online. Go to the next one. Subways, public areas. Have you ever seen somebody walking down the road, and they were, they were looking down? This is like the new way to walk. Isn't that true? I mean, this is like, this is how everybody walks now. I don't know. We're, we're literally walking, and we're depending on our peripheral vision to make sure we don't die. You know what I'm saying? Even like crossing the street. There's cars coming, people. Put the phone up for a minute, right? But I don't know why we're just so drawn. I mean, it's like this addictive, passionate deal, this obsessive part of our personality that we've got to always be looking at this screen. It's crazy. Go to the next one. This is even true. I'm, honestly, I think we're all guilty of it. Uh, even sitting around restaurants at times, uh, we're, we're really trying to start a, a new rule to where when we eat, when we have a meal... Everybody turns in their device. I don't care what it is. We're just going to start saying no devices in restaurants, no devices at the dinner table. It's a pretty good rule just to say, hey, at this moment for this time, let's, this is crazy, let's have conversation. What? We've got to talk to each other? What in the world? You mean we've got to to look at each other in the eyes? It's crazy, right? But this is just kind of, again, helping us understand This is, in many ways, an epidemic in our culture to where we're just always consumed by this this technology that it does bring great benefit, but also it brings great burden. So idolatry is an excessive or blind devotion, a reverence or a love for someone or something. If we're defining idolatry, let me read that again. Idolatry is an excessive or a blind devotion, a blind devotion. Maybe you don't see it, you don't recognize it, you don't understand it. But through the conviction of the Holy Spirit, I'm telling you, he will definitely reveal to you if this or other things are a problem. You may not have a problem with social media. Maybe you don't have a problem with technology. But God may reveal, or I'm pretty sure he will reveal to you within the next 30 minutes, that there are areas of your life, there are things, there are possessions, there are items, there are people, there are relationships that you've elevated, that we've elevated into a position that belongs only to God. Here's the truth. Idolatry is spiritual adultery. Idolatry is spiritual adultery. 
You may say, what do you mean like, what are you, what are you talking about? Let me, let me just kind of give you this parallel scenario. It's like a husband telling his wife, um, man, I love you. And let's spend, I tell you what, let's spend three hours together on Sunday morning. Let's just hang out. Let's talk. I want to sing songs to you. By the way, I do not sing songs to Amy. All right? That's just not how, how I roll. But, but let's just work with me. All right? I want to sing songs to you. I want to show and express my devotion to you. You're my wife. I love you. And so I want to, in fact, I'm going to, I'm going to read uh, stories that remind me of your love for me and my love for you. I just I want to spend this time devoted to you. I'm going to go to a particular place. We're going to call this our marriage, uh, you know, reminiscent love place. We're going, to, we're going to remember how much we love each other here, right? And then Monday, you go six days without talking to or having a relationship with her. This man finds another woman, maybe multiple women, and, and he devotes all of his attention, his time. He invests every resource that he has in those women instead of the one that he marries. That is a picture of how many people call themselves Christians, live their lives. I mean, they come to a place called a worship center, and buddy, for two or three hours, maybe, right? For two or three hours, maybe they devote their attention to God every other week, you know, three times a month, maybe, you know, because, I mean, we want to show God how much we love him. And so we, we set aside this important time to come together in corporate worship. But it's so crazy, man. Six days a week, it seems like many Christians, many believers, many North American followers of Jesus check out of their faith. It's like they step out of their faith and they live their life in spiritual adultery. They, they, they value other things. And, and let me just go ahead and say we, all right? We need, to, we need to step ourselves into this. We value other things more than Jesus sometimes. You may say, well, man, I, I can't even think of anything. I, I really hope and pray you open up your heart and say, Holy Spirit, speak to me. Holy Spirit, show me something in my life, someone in my life that I have placed over you, that I have given priority in my schedule, my resources, my energy, my time, my passion, my obsession, that there is something or someone that may be in position that belongs to you. See, that's, that's a definition of of idolatry, and it's one we don't like to hear, and I'm telling you, it makes for a very quiet Sunday morning service, amen, because it's tough, right? So we've got to define idolatry, but then secondly, the second step is we've got to identify my idols, and I say my, your idols too, right? I've got to make this personal, and I've got to say it's not just enough to know what an idol is, the definition of an idol, but I've got to identify idols in my life. I've got to know, hey, what are some idols? Um, I've been to Thailand a couple times and, and China a couple times. Both of those places are, are great examples of what I'm about to share. There are times and there are still people on the planet that worship statues, all right? And, and sometimes we think, that is so Old Testament stuff, Wayne. People don't bow down to statues anymore. But man, when you get off the plane in Thailand and you're told by your missionary that 98.5% of the people you lay your eyes on while you're in this country believe in Buddhism, and they, they follow Buddhism, and this whole, this whole religion is built around uh, worshiping idols, and, and, and you think, and again, walking through, riding in the van, and rush hour, and crazy stuff in Bangkok, Thailand, surrounded by millions of people, no exaggeration, millions of people, and just this overwhelming thought that though God may love every one of these people, these millions of people, 98.5% of them are going to spend eternity separated from a loving God in a place called hell. And somehow they've displaced worship in their lives, and they're worshiping statues. Let me show you this picture of, of a real-life family. I mean, you can even see, like, they're intentionally training this child, right, to go to the temple. We visited a temple when we were there. And, and I know, again, it sounds crazy, but they would go to the, the priest in the temple and they would start asking, how do I do this? And the priest would show them how to light the candle. We watched people learning how to worship idols. Like they literally would light incense. They would bow down. They would get on the rug and they would, they would put their face on the ground worshiping a rock, worshiping some idol made of concrete or wood. It makes zero sense. But here's the deal. 
We can see stuff like that and we can say, okay, idols are still present in other countries, Wayne. Absolutely. I totally get that. Buddhist temples all over the place. Even though our, you know, couple hundred million people are isolated from that for the most part. Though you can find a temple, a, a Hindu or a Buddhist temple um, uh, in, in our area even. Uh, it's, not, it's not prominent. It's not in our face. But, but, and so, yes, yeah, it's there. Man, we lose sight of the majority of our world is exposed to this kind of stuff. The majority of our world lives in a day where they totally understand and get this idea of, of graven images and bowing down to statues. But it'd be real easy for us to say, well, that's over there. We're here. And so we don't have idolatry. Man, we don't have idols. And I would say you do not have to bow down to a statue to be an idolater. You don't have to bow down in a Buddhist temple to be an idolater. We are all guilty. It may not be in the shape of Buddha, but man, we, are, we definitely worship things in various shapes and sizes, as we read in Deuteronomy. The fact of the matter is the idolatry does, is not defined by the, the object that you're worshiping in that sense. It doesn't have to be a statue. It's really the heart of the worship and that it's not God, the one true God, the one who deserves our worship. Here's what John Piper says. He says it starts in the heart. Man, that's such an important place to, to really grab a hold of this. Idolatry starts in the heart, craving wanting, enjoying, being satisfied by anything that you treasure more than God. Then that's so true. That is an idol. So what is an idol? It is anything that my heart longs for more than Jesus. What's an idol? It's anything that I'm hungry for, I'm craving for more than Christ in my heart and my life. So what is an idol in my life? How can I identify my idols? Well, it, it is a thing or it could be a person that you love more than God, that you practically live out your love for more than God. Now, I'm not talking about the Sunday school answer, who do you love more than anybody? Oh, Jesus, you know. We know the answer and we follow Jesus and we say we're Christians. But here's what I want you to say, what is your life speaking? You know, do you love Jesus or your girlfriend or boyfriend more, right? I mean, do you love Jesus or your husband or wife more? Your children. You know, what's your greatest desire in life? Think about it for just a minute. What's your greatest desire in life? Oh, preacher, I want my, I want my kids to grow up and, and to be successful. I want them to be healthy. And is that your greatest desire in life? Because see, if so, it's idolatry. You may say, oh, that's a really tough definition of idolatry. No, it's really biblical. Because here's the deal. Is that important that our children be successful? Absolutely. I would say that's a very high priority in our lives. I mean, I want that to happen too, all right? But here's the deal. Nothing should have priority over your devotion and your allegiance and your honor that's shown to God. That should be number one. And if anything else becomes a higher priority, we are guilty of idol worship. We are guilty of idolatry. So approval from others. We can make approval from others an idol. We can so be hungry for this affirmation. I mean, think about the post. And we're going to get to this in, in another week. But you put a post on on whatever social media platform that you choose, and you immediately are hungry for this affirmation, that is such a, a, a revelation sometimes that we value that affirmation at a higher level. Let me just ask you, I mean, do you, do you, would you rather have hundreds of likes or know that God is pleased with you? I know we know the Christian answer. Yeah, God. God. We choose God. But see, what makes us happier? To know that we're being obedient to God and He's pleased with our actions? Or that we posted something that everybody liked a lot. I mean, it's, it's such a hard thing to talk about, but it's so real in the Christian life in this day that we can make an idol out of anything. Even success in our business. We should be driven. We should care about doing our good job. We should desire, you know, to, to be successful in our businesses. But it should never become an idol. That should never become more important to me than my devotion to Jesus Christ. It could be a hobby that you have. It could be a fun hobby, a good thing that God has given to you. But, but it's, not, it's not the provider, it's the provision. So we shouldn't place the provision, that which God has given to us, over the provider, God himself. But that's what we're guilty of when we are idol worshipers. Romans chapter 1, go and look there with me real quick. It should, should have some scripture on the screens in just a second. But Romans chapter 1 is usually a highly debated passage of scripture, especially in our day of debate over homosexuality and all of those uh, contentious issues. But Romans 1, while I definitely believe with all of my heart it speaks to that, it's a broader context. When you look at the broader context of verse 21 and on, we're talking about general idol worship too. We're not just talking about one particular sin. And I think people, oftentimes, self-righteous people could really just look at that. We can look at one thing and say, well, that sin's what we're talking about. 
You know what? Anything that we choose to do that places it or, or other people or other things or even our desires above our honor and glory for God, it is idol worship. We become idolaters regardless if we say we're a Christian or not. Look at verse 21 of Romans 1. Here's what it says. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their f- uh, foolish hearts were darkened. So I want you to understand, this is not picking on anyone. We can become foolish if we lift up an idol, if we have a possession or a person that becomes an idol in our heart. What we're doing is we're foolishly allowing our hearts to be dark. In Luke verse 22 and 23, although they claim to be wise... <laughs> Although, don't we all? Though they claim to be wise, they became fools. And listen to what this is so simple to understand. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images. They literally made a trade. They traded the glory of God for their desires. They traded the glory of God for something they wanted more in their flesh. Now look at this in verse 25. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie. So they, they totally, eyes wide open, they understood what they were doing. And let me stop saying they. When we are idol worshiping, when we put things above God, when we take Jesus off the throne of our heart and we put a man or a woman or a thing or some possession, some material junk in the throne, we are literally making an exchange. We are trading the truth about God. What's the truth about God? That he is worthy, man. God is worthy. God, God is so much more valuable than that possession. God is so much more valuable than that desire. See, and this is where it's applicable in our day. No matter what it is that's, that we're longing for, we're thirsting for. We're going to hear that in a minute from the passage of Scripture and Psalms. No matter what we're thirsting for, we're longing for. I mean, our flesh desires it. We're longing for it. But here's the deal. We all would agree. I would hope that God is more worthy of our praise than that. God is more worthy of our worship than that, right? God's more worthy of my devotion than that material possession or this success in, uh, in, in our job or, our, or even the success of our family. See, our devotion to God is worth more than that promotion you're looking after, right? That, that's just totally, we, we would all want to say that's how we're living our lives. But this is the, the roadblock to idolatry. They exchanged the, the truth about God for a lie, and they worshiped and served created things rather than creator who is forever praised. So this is a definition in many ways that helps us identify idols in our own lives. What are idols in our own lives? Anything that we've traded for God. Anything that we've positioned in God's place. Anything we want more than God. Oh, preacher, I don't want anything more than God. I want you to check your schedule. Check your records. Ask yourself the honest question. What do I really love? Who do I really love most in my life? So we see we we have to define idols. We have to identify the idols. But then third, we've got to acknowledge the struggle. Here's the deal. We can hear it all day long, and man, you could even sit here and go, I totally agree with you, but I got it all straight, right? I mean, we could easily look over. It's what we do, man. It's in this me culture. It's no longer a we culture. It's definitely no longer a he culture. It is a me culture. And so in this me culture, we can hear somebody speak truth, and we can totally say, I agree with that. It just doesn't apply to me. (laughs) I totally think you're saying the right thing. It's just I don't have that problem. And we can somehow compromise to such a degree that we lose sight of reality. And we think we don't really deal with this. I'm telling you, all of us, every follower of Jesus struggles to please themselves more than God. To put other things in the place of God on his throne. And so this third step is so important. we got to acknowledge the struggle. We can't fix something we don't admit. As long as we're in denial, we're not going to be able to help ourselves in this process. And here's just a simple little statement that just drives it home. God doesn't just want to be your top God. God doesn't just want to be your most important God in a list of gods. I had a really good friend who was a Hindu um, and, uh, and, and a wonderful guy. I really uh, I loved him for multiple reasons. Number one, he was, uh, he was uh, my, my guy at Dunkin' Donuts, and I went there all the time. You can tell, amen? And I, and I really appreciated uh, that he would always give me coffee and donuts. But, but aside from that, he eventually started coming to when we'd have a midday 
service of any kind, I would invite Kathan, and, and he was just a, man, I'm telling you, I really did have a great friendship with this guy who totally disagreed with faith, um, uh, you know, with me. And, uh, but he would come, and this was so confusing, it was hard for me to understand, but he would sit in that process, he would sit in a worship service, and even, uh, you know, somewhat participate, he would definitely listen and be respectful, and we would talk about Jesus afterwards, and, and he would always say something to the fact of, you know what, I don't, I don't not believe your God. Look, I want to respect Jesus, and don't you know, I take Jesus, and I'm just going to, what I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to add my faith in Jesus to all these other things. Because of his Hindu faith, he worships any number of things. Obviously, they bring, believe in reincarnation and a lot of in, tran, you know, transcendental meditation, a lot of stuff like that. But at the end of the day, it wasn't that he didn't want to believe Jesus. He just didn't want to totally believe Jesus exclusively as the only way to heaven. And so here's the deal. A lot of our culture has now seeped over into the church. And if we're not careful as followers of Jesus, we will totally miss this and think that we're not guilty of it. But sometimes we are guilty of saying totally, hey, Sunday morning, it's Jesus Day, man, right? And we're going to lift up the name of Jesus. We're going to sing about the love of Jesus. We're going to sing about how he can, hey, he can overcome mountains, right? He's going to tear them down, baby. There's nothing that can come against me that's going to prosper because I'm a follower of Jesus. Then Monday comes, and we totally live like we don't believe what we sung on Sunday, right? It's because we're just adding Jesus to our other gods. I mean, we can say, oh, I surrender all to you, God. I mean, I would give everything for you. You are, you are more glorious. You're, you're worthy of my praise. And so no matter what else attra is attractive to me, I'm going to give you my life. I'm devoting that on Sunday, then Tuesday, and Wednesday come. And everything that we do, the time we invest, man, everything that we do, the words that we say, the relationships we make, we are living a life that's contrary to the commitment we say on Sunday, the the songs we sing on Sunday. What is that? Oh, we don't, it's not that we're denying Jesus. We're just adding Jesus to the other list of idols, the other list of gods that are in our lives. And, but here's the deal. Listen, God doesn't want to be your top God. He doesn't want to be the top one on your list. He wants to erase the other ones as gods. He wants us to acknowledge this struggle and say that, God, we understand we're going to love the provisions that you, you've given us. Man, thank the Lord for food. Hallelujah. Yeah, but, but it's very, but you know what happens in my life when I recognize this struggle in my life about eating? Let me just be honest with you, all right? Really transparent and embarrassing. But what happens in my life? Now, some people are overweight for various reasons. Mine is obviously a, a spiritual problem when I fail. And I'm just, man, you talk about accountability. Just created some accountability there, brother, let me tell you, you know? Because, but here's the deal. What I, what I do when I, when, I, when I give in to that is I'm basically saying, God, I know, I know that I say I love you, and I know that you want me to live a life that's pleasing to you, and I don't, I don't want to be gluttonous because gluttony, gluttony is a sin. I mean, it's a sin. It's clearly a sin. But even though I'm eyes wide open, I'm acknowledging that, that I definitely want to worship you more because you're worthy. Man, sometimes when I'm at the Asian buffet, hallelujah, that stuff looks good. You know what I'm saying? And, and my, my fleshly desire for the thing overpowers my inner desire to please him. And here's the deal. In that moment, like it or not, admit it or not, food is an idol to me. And see, again, that's, preacher, that's just too real. You just need to keep speaking generalities. Don't bring up buffets. Amen, you know? And I get it. I don't, I don't want to say that kind of thing. But I'm telling you, Jesus is in your business. Like it or not. I mean, I know in our day, everybody wants to go to church and feel better about what they're doing and, and wants everybody to condone their problems and their sins. We are messed up people who need Jesus. We desperately need Jesus. And this is one of the things, if we will acknowledge our struggle, God can bring great victory in our lives. Or we can leave this place and live in denial, and we can live a defeated life. We can survive. Maybe we'll survive, but we will never thrive as God intends us to. Psalm 42, 1 and 2 says, As the deer pants, listen to this, listen to this language. As the deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go to meet with God? Man, does that sound like us? When can I go to worship God? Man, I can't wait until I'm able to go and worship God. 
believe it or not, I was a cross-country runner in high school. I ran 3.1 miles a day, even in practice and preparation for the actual meet, the 5K, uh, whenever that was, like on uh, whatever day of the week. And, and so we would, we would have to run constantly. And at the end of that 3.1 miles, even though I was many pounds lighter at that time, uh, after that 3.1 miles, I was exhausted. I was all I can remember even now, like having to work hard to catch my breath. I mean, my, my lungs were just fatigued. My body was dead. I was tired. And, and I mean, after all of those people had passed me, and I was usually the last one or one of the last ones, I was exhausted, even though I because I had given it all, all I had. I'd get finished, and I, I remember like I'd never been more thirsty in my life. You know, I was so longing for the water. And I can remember, even though uh, the psalmist uses a deer panting for water, I think of this picture in my own life of how thirsty I was at those moments and how, man, when someone would bring me the water, even though I was so thirsty for it, sometimes I had to catch my breath because I was so desperate for the water and this rehydration that my body had to actually catch up in preparation because I was longing for it so much. And, and I'm just wondering, I mean, listen, it's not that we don't long for things like this, all right? We get it. We understand our desperation for something sometimes. It's desperation for someone. Sometimes it's desperation for a possession, desperation for a house, a car, whatever it is, a job. And we are longing after it. Man, we are thirsty for those things. And I'm just asking the question because it's a question that God really did pose to my heart. Do I have him at the top of that list? And see, that's, that's, a, that's an easy question to ask. That's a very difficult question to answer unless we're just going to lie about it. But the truth of the matter is, I think if we evaluate our lives, if we look at our, our hearts, it's very difficult to say that the things we do, the words we say, the decisions we make, put Jesus first every day. And so if that's the case, we need to acknowledge the struggle and stop playing a game, stop lying about it, and own up to it and say to God, I'm sorry. Lord, I repent of this. I don't want to be active in the spiritual adultery where I say I love you on Sunday, but you couldn't tell it on Thursday. God forbid, I, I want to give you my life. I want to truly live for you. So these steps to, um, to uh, reclaiming worship, defining idolatry, identifying our idols, acknowledging the struggle, and fourth and final, dethrone the distractions. We've got to dethrone the distractions. If we want, once we acknowledge, we say, okay, these are idols, and then I acknowledge that there are idols that are in my heart. There are, there are ways that I am worshiping, that I am longing after some things, some people more than I'm longing after Jesus. And so once I acknowledge that, I've got to dethrone these things. Look at Colossians 3, 5 on the screen here. Paul says, put to death. He didn't say play with, right? He didn't say think about this. He says, put to death, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. This is the flesh, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is, say that word with me, idolatry. Say that again, idolatry. I mean, this is idolatry. This is what it means to be an idol worshiper. Why? Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. The wrath of God is coming. Now, this is not like God's standing up there and he's, he's zapping people. He's picking you out because you did something. You stepped, you stepped in the wrong place. And so he's like, boom, got them, wrath of God. It's not that. If we can have this picture again, the umbrella of God, the grace of God, I say this all the time. As long as you're under this umbrella of God's grace, you're safe. But outside the umbrella, the wrath of God is already being poured out. It doesn't have to start being poured out, all right? God has targeted idolatry as, as the recipient of his wrath. We don't even have to wonder, if I do this, is God going to be upset? Yes, all right? If I put something else above him, then I'm positioning. What I'm doing is I'm stepping outside of the umbrella of his grace, and I am positioning myself under the wrath of God because his wrath is coming, his wrath is being poured out on idolatry. His wrath is being poured out on sin. That doesn't make God unloving. It makes us foolish. That's what idolatry is. It's foolishness with eyes wide open, knowing that we are sinning, knowing that we are putting something else above God. We step outside His grace and we position ourselves under His wrath. God forbid. Paul says, please don't do this. Man, there's nothing more dangerous than the wrath of an omnipotent God. And Paul says that wrath is naturally drawn toward the act of idolatry. Man, we've got to run away from it. Psalm 4, uh, 24, 3 and 4, this is closing. It says, who may ascend to the mountains of the Lord? Who may stand in the holy place? Who can really worship God? If we're talking about worship, reclaiming worship, 
Who can really worship God? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart. Who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. So, so what is the deal? How do, how do we think about this? We're distracted by many things in our hands and in our hearts. It's not a question of, do we have this problem, guys? We need to acknowledge our hands are filled with things. Our hearts are filled with things that are contrary to the word of God. There are so many things that we have prioritized above God. It's not just church attendance. It is God we're talking about. We desperately need God to clean our hands in our hearts. We desperately need God to, to bring us back to this place where we can dethrone the distractions and make much of Jesus. Why? Because Jesus ultimately deserves every single breath of praise that we have to give him. John Piper said this in closing, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. Here's the question. Man, are you satisfied with Jesus? And does he satisfy you? Is he enough for me? Or am I going to trade his glory? Am I going to exchange his glory for something else my flesh longs for more? Man, you may be here today and, and maybe you're new to, to church. But I'm telling you, you get this. You understand. I, I, I don't care who you are. No matter what age or gender, we understand. We, we, we're making exchanges constantly. We're trading. I want to I wanna challenge you today. To make the greatest exchange of your life. To, to lay down all of the distractions. To lay down all of the things that hinder you from knowing Jesus as your Savior. And to choose Him. To make Him first. You may say, what's that? that well, that's, that's becoming a Christian. That's actually becoming a follower of Jesus. If you've never done that, then today's the day to make that decision. Maybe you're a Christian. Maybe you're a follower of Jesus. And you're like me. You'd say, this is extremely convicting. Man, at your seat, you can pray. You can say, God, I just want to make a commitment. I want, to, I, want, I want to make you first. I want you number one. You may want to bring a friend. Just come to the altar and pray. Man, nobody's going to bug you. you. You would have time just with God, just to say, God, forgive me. I want you to be number one in my life. During this time of commitment, I just want to challenge you to make those decisions. All right, let's pray. Lord, God, we love you. Lord, I, I know that in, in our day it's so easy to, to be distracted. I'm as guilty as anyone in this room of being distracted by meaningless things and, and trading my allegiance and, and the glory that I, I know is due to you, God, to trade that, make an exchange for something that's far less worthy of it. And so, God, today I pray that we would just with total abandonment make that commitment to come back, reject the struggle, God, to really just lean into you, to gain the confidence and the strength we need to live out loud for Jesus. That's our prayer, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me?